And welcome to a new video on the Delphi murders. In this video, I will be sharing my thoughts and analysis on the recently disclosed affidavit concerning Ron Logan and his potential connection to the Delphi murders. Firstly, I will quickly go through the document in question, and then I will join you at the end to share my own thoughts and feelings. It's worth noting before we start this video that the victims Abigail Williams and Liberty German are referred to as AW and LG in the following transcript. I, Nicole Robertson, am a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation and have been employed as such for 12 years. Prior to her employment as an FBI agent, Nicole Robertson was employed as a Sauk Village, Illinois police officer for approximately six years. Nicole Robertson is assigned to the Maryville Resident Agency and currently participates in the investigation of all violent crimes. Background, point one. On February 13th, 2017, at approximately 1pm, juvenile victims, hereafter referred to as LG and AW, were taken to the Monon Highbridge Trail located in Delphi, Indiana. LG and AW were walking the trail in the area of County Road 300 North and 575 West near latitude 40, 35 degrees, 21.4 degrees, longitude 86, 38 degrees, 23.3 degrees, at approximately 2.13pm, which was the time of last contact with LG and AW by cellular device. The victims were to be picked up by a family member at 3pm, and the victims never met with the family member. Approximately 5.30pm was the last successful ping of the cellular phone by AT&T. The victims LG and AW were located deceased on February 14, 2017 at approximately 12.17pm at the above listed latitude and longitude, having been the victims of murder. Section 2. A suspect has been developed of a white male wearing a blue jacket with a heavy physical build, wearing a cap and blue jeans. The development of this suspect was made by a 43 second video taken on LG's phone where the suspect follows the victims as they are walking on the Monon Highbridge Trail. Near the end of the video, the suspect speaks to the victims saying, quote, down the hill. It sounds as though he is directing the victims to leave the trail they were on and enter the wooded area below. No person has come forward and identified himself as the person who met the victims and made the statement in LG's video. Therefore, it is believed that person in LG's video participated in the killings. Images of the suspect have been broadcast on the news media since February 15, 2017 as a person of interest. Section 3. LG and AW are presumed to have made contact with the unknown male at approximately 2.13pm based upon analysis of LG's cell phone, which recorded the video. Section 4. On February 14, 2017, at approximately 12.17pm, victims LG and AW were found dead with wounds caused by a redacted weapon on the property owned by Ronald Logan. A large amount of blood was lost by the victims at the crime scene. Because of the nature of the victim's wounds, it is nearly certain the perpetrator of the crime would have gotten blood on his person or clothing. The location of the crime scene is approximately 1,400 feet from Logan's residence. Section 5. Logan is a 77-year-old male. Logan's physical build is consistent with that of the male suspect videoed by LG on the Monon Highbridge Trail. Logan owns farmland and cares for large farm animals. Logan appears to be in good physical condition. Logan has been interviewed several times. His voice is not inconsistent with that of the person in the video. Point 6. It was also discovered that the redacted of one of the victims was missing from the crime scene while the rest of their clothing was recovered. It also appeared the girls' bodies were moved and staged. Based upon my training and experience, 
It is common for perpetrators of this type of crime to take a souvenir or in some fashion memorialise the crime scene, whether by photos or electronic or digital methods that are then downloaded onto computers, storage devices, tablets, phones, iPad devices or other electronic devices that store digital data for later viewing, scanning or copying. Point 7. LG and AW had no visible signs of a struggle or fight. Point 8. During the processing of the crime scene, investigators located unknown fibres and unidentified hairs, which may later be used for comparison of similar fibres or hairs. Point 9. Logan owns numerous weapons, including handguns and knives, that were observed by LEOs during the execution of a search warrant that took place at his home on March 6, 2017. Logan's home was searched as a result of a probation violation. The search was limited to the discovery of firearms and included only his main residence. We now move on to section 10, where there is some talk of Ron Logan's cousin, who we will refer to as Male One. On February 14, 2017, at approximately 9.20am, Logan contacted his cousin, Male One. Logan asked Male One to tell the police that Male One came to Logan's home between 2pm and 2.30pm on February 13th, 2017 to pick Logan up. Logan further told Male One to say that Male One drove Logan to an aquarium store in Lafayette, Indiana. Logan told Male One to say that they returned home to Logan's house between 5 and 5.30pm. 5 Point 11. On February 14, 2017, while requesting consent to search Logan's property, a law enforcement officer, known as a LEO, advised Logan that LEOs would not search his home unless evidence led LEOs to Logan's house. In that meeting, Logan told the LEO that he did not think evidence would lead them to that, but said, quote, I don't know. Point 12. A receipt from Aquarium World in Lafayette, dated February 13, 2017, with a checkout time of 5.21pm, was found in Logan's home on March 6, 2017, during a probation violation search. Logan resides approximately 22 miles from the store. It would take approximately 30 minutes to get to the store from Logan's home. Point 13. On March 6, 2017, during an interview with a LEO, Logan said he was picked up by Mail One around 3pm and taken straight to the aquarium store in Lafayette. In the March 6, 2017 interview, Logan said after he was done at the aquarium store, he was driven straight home. These statements were found to be factually false and intentionally designed to deceive LEOs. Point 14. On March 7, 2017, Mail One was interviewed by a LEO. Mail One told the LEO that he was with Logan on Monday, February 13, 2017, and that Mail One drove Logan to the aquarium store in Lafayette. On March 9, 2017, Mail One was interviewed by another LEO regarding the trip to the aquarium. Mail One told the LEO that he had lied when he was interviewed by the LEO on March 7, 2017, at Logan's request. Mail One explained that Logan had never asked Mail One to lie for him in the past. Mail One knows that Logan has driven his vehicle while on probation, was is prohibited from doing so. Mail One also said that Logan did not ask him to lie for Logan when Logan drove to the transfer station earlier in the day. Point 15. On March 12, 2017, Mail One explained in an interview to an LEO that Logan called him on the morning of February 14th, 2017 and asked him to provide the alibi for Logan's drive to the aquarium in Lafayette. This phone call was made prior to the LEO's discovery of LG and AW's deceased bodies. Based on investigators' experience, it is reasonable to believe that the creation of an alibi prior to the discovery of a crime indicates culpability or knowledge of the crime. Point 16. Mail 1 said he thought the photograph of the mail that was released by the media of the man on the bridge looked like Logan. Point 17. 
Elios learned that Logan had driven on February the 13th, 2017 to the transfer station in Delphi, Indiana to drop off trash. Video from the transfer station shows Logan driving his white Ford pickup truck between 11.27am and 11.32am. The video from the transfer station appears to be off by 26 minutes, putting Logan at the transfer station from approximately 11.53am and 11.58am. Point 18. Logan did not ask Mail 1 to provide an alibi for his drive to the transfer station on February the 13th, 2017. Logan only asked Mail 1 to provide an alibi for a trip that would have occurred at the time of the apparent abduction of LG and AW. We now move on to past relationships concerning Ron Logan. The redacted names during this section will be referred to as Female 1. Section 19. On March 8, 2017, Female 1 was interviewed by LEOs. Female 1 met Logan about 7 or 8 years ago. Female 1 was in a personal relationship with Logan for a couple of months and would stay with him in his home on the weekends. Female 1 left Logan after he became physically abusive. During her interview, Female 1 explained that Logan continued to stalk and harass her after their breakup. During their relationship, Logan had dragged Female 1 out of her car by her hair. Female 1 still fears Logan. Female 1 has not had contact with Logan in approximately two years. Female 1 told interviewers that Logan had told her in the past that he could kill her and no one would find her body. Section 20. During her March 8, 2017 interview, Female 1 said that she knew Logan carried a gun everywhere he went. Female 1 knew that Logan would carry a gun in a fanny pack. Female 1 described Logan's fanny pack as one made out of a nicer material. Section 21. During her March 8, 2017 interview, Female 1 told Elios when she first saw the photograph of the man on the bridge, she thought the police were looking for Logan because she thought the photograph was Logan. Female 1 did not initially realise that the photograph was that of the suspect. Section 22. A call placed using Logan's cell phone produced cell tower data that shows Logan's cell phone appears to be in or around his property on February the 13th, 2017 at 2.09pm. Although his exact location cannot be confirmed, the tower data shows that Logan's cell phone was in the Delphi area in the area of the Monon High Bridge Trail. Section 23. An analysis of Logan's cell phone data revealed a text message sent from his phone at 7.56pm on February 13, 2017. Initial exam of this analysis indicates Logan's phone was likely outside of his residence and in the proximity of where LG and AW's bodies were located. Section 25 Logan met with Elios on or about February 17, 2017, while they were on his property. Logan was physically able to get up and down the hill from his home to the crime scene. Section 26. On March 14, 2017, Logan's former housemate, Female 2, was interviewed. Female 2 resided with Logan from about September 2016 through December of 2016. Female 2 was in a sexual relationship with Logan on and off for approximately three years. During the interview with Elios, Female 2 said that when she first learned that AW and LG were missing and then found dead near Logan's home, her initial thought was that Logan was involved. Female 2 said in her interview that she feared Logan and even previously told her baby's father if she ever ended up dead, Logan did it. Section 27. On March 14, 2017, Female 2 explained in her interview that Logan had been violent with her in the past. Female 2 explained that on July 4, 2016, while at Logan's home, Logan punched her in the face, knocking her down. Female 2 explained that she was drinking, but Logan was completely sober during the incident. Female 2 also explained that Logan was angry because she disrespected Logan while in Logan's home. Section 28. 
On February the 13th, 2017, LG's family began searching the area of the trail where LG and AW were initially dropped off beginning shortly after 3pm. LG's family and other community members joined the search shortly thereafter. Carroll County Sheriff's Office was notified at approximately 5.30pm that LG and AW were missing. Once the search for LG and AW began, no one reported seeing any person matching the description of the male on the bridge. Section 29. The FBI has established a database for the collection and organisation of tips provided by the public in this case. A search of the database has revealed 15 tips in which citizens both known and anonymous attributed the crime to Logan for various reasons. Section 30. Based on the above aforementioned facts, Logan was in the area at the time the crime occurred and that he provided false information about his activities during the crime to law enforcement, has a prior propensity for violence, employed others to assist in deceiving law enforcement and plotted an alibi for a crime that had not yet been discovered. Okay, so what are my own personal thoughts and analysis on this document? Now, having listened to the narration of this document on the Murder Sheet podcast, I guess my initial thoughts and feelings when listening to this was, it does sound quite damning in a lot of places, albeit the vast majority of the evidence at this point is, I guess, circumstantial. The vibe I got was not a particularly good one. The first thing that came into my mind was, why is this man trying to obtain an alibi before the girls' bodies were discovered? Now, when looking into a case or a situation, I try and look at as many different perspectives as possible in the hope of offering a balanced viewpoint. So having such a strong feeling early on about this statement, about this sort of uneasiness regarding this desire to obtain an alibi... I decided to step back for one moment and actually put myself in the position of Ron Logan for one moment. Now, bearing in mind he's got this probation situation hanging over his head, he's been to the fish shop, he's been to the tropical fish shop that day. What I believe may have happened here is that at some point in time during the afternoon of February the 13th, the search party has been arranged, there's people there looking for the girls, someone has spoken to Ron Logan... And they've given him, I guess, a kind of a background of what has taken place. You know, the girls were supposed to be picked up at three o'clock. They haven't turned up. In his mind, he's going to be thinking, right, okay, the police are going to be coming to me. You know, this is right near my property. They're going to be asking, where was I from three o'clock? What am I going to say? I can't exactly say, well, bloody hell, I was driving my car. You know, I can't say that. What am I going to do? I certainly don't believe it's beyond the realms of possibility that someone approached Ron Logan and gave him, I guess, you know, a background as to what's taken place. The girls are supposed to be picked up just after three o'clock. They haven't showed up. Have you seen them? Could we check your land? He's going to be thinking, actually, I wasn't with anybody. I was driving my car. This could get me sent to prison. What am I going to do? Now, what also, I guess, lends a little bit more credibility to that, at least in my mind, is the fact that he hasn't tried to obtain an alibi that evening. Now, if you were involved in a murder, if you were, you know, a party to a murder or you committed murder, would you not be trying to arrange an alibi that very same day? Why would you wait until 9am the next morning before calling your cousin to try and, I guess, hash together some kind of alibi? Now, I'm not entirely sure when the search resumed on the 14th of February looking for the girls, but one would have to assume that this was pre-9am in the morning. So could it have been that Ron Logan has woken up in the morning the next day, there's people still searching or the search has now resumed, he's actually thinking in his own mind, well, Christ, this isn't just a case that two girls have gone missing, they're going to be, you know, they're going to turn up, you know, safe and sound, this could be a little bit more serious. The police are surely going to be knocking on my door at any moment. Is that what provoked him to, I guess, arrange that alibi just after 9am in the morning. I would imagine that the search resumed once daylight hit, maybe 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, but I can't really find any data as to what time, as I say, the search resumed on the 14th of February. But to me, that's how I could see it playing out in terms of Logan panicking regarding the police coming over and asking for him to account for his whereabouts. Now, some people will say, rightly or wrongly so, Why did he not arrange an alibi for the entirety of the day? Why only after 3pm? Why is that so important? Well, I guess that then links back to what we've just spoken about there, the fact that 
Logan may have heard some news that the girls were supposed to be picked up at three o'clock. He's thinking in his mind, the police are going to come over. They're going to ask me where I was from three o'clock onwards or maybe 2.30. Maybe in his mind, that was the critical time period which the police would be interested in. They wouldn't be so interested what he was doing during the daytime. They'd be solely focused on his whereabouts. Did he see anything, most importantly, between the hours of 3 p.m. and, say, 5 o'clock? Now, regarding the trip to the tropical fish shop in Lafayette, I would actually say that that event did take place. They found a receipt at Ron Logan's home dated February the 13th, 2017, with a checkout time of 5.21pm. But what isn't mentioned in the document here is, you know, did law enforcement go to this shop? Did they check with the staff there? Did they check CCTV? Interestingly, that's not actually mentioned in the document. So this could simply be an individual who is incredibly fearful of breaking his probation, being sent to jail, he shouldn't be driving a car, how's he going to explain this, he knows the police can be knocking at the door, he knows the girl should have been picked up at three o'clock, what's he going to say, where is he going to say he was, who can back up his story? That is a distinct possibility, but where things get a little bit more suspicious, at least in my mind, is when we take a look at the phone usage concerning Ron Logan on the day of the murders. Now, there's a Snapchat photo uploaded by the girls at around 2.05 and 2.07 p.m. on the day of their disappearance. So they're on the bridge, they're walking across the bridge, there's a photograph of Abby which is taken, and I believe that one is uploaded at around 2.07 p.m. Now, is it a coincidence that Ron Logan then makes a phone call just a couple of minutes later at 2.09pm? There's no discussion here in this document about who this call was to, what the, what the telephone call entailed, what the telephone call was about. Is it just a pure coincidence here that these girls are spotted on the bridge, Ron Logan is using his phone according to the document in his residence or around his residence at that time period, 2.09pm, a little bit strange. Now where this gets even more bizarre is the fact that four minutes after this telephone call is made by Ron Logan, we have the guy on the bridge approaching the girls, the video which was snapped on Liberty German's smartphone. Is that just a pure coincidence that four minutes after this telephone call from Ron Logan, the man is basically halfway or three quarters of the way across the bridge approaching the girls? What I also find interesting is that in the photographs taken by the girls, this man does not appear anywhere. As I say, these photographs were taken around 2.05 to 2.07pm, yet at 2.13pm, this guy approaching the girls is basically halfway or three quarters of the way across the bridge, ready to approach. One thing that I will say regarding the Delphi murders is that the more and more that I look into this case... The more and more transcripts I read, the more and more I take a look at the crime scene and how this crime was committed, potentially. The more and more convinced I am that there's at least one person involved here. Even if you believe that Ron Logan is the man on the bridge, Ron Logan is the man who takes the girls across the creek. Do you really believe that Ron Logan could kill those girls in such a fashion where they are basically left without defensive injury, without defensive wounds, no sign of fight, no sign of fleeing the scene or attempting to flee the scene. I just don't see that as possible. We're talking about a 70-year-old man here. Does that mean he's completely innocent, that he doesn't have any involvement at all in this crime? Of course it doesn't. And as I say, I'm actually quite torn in terms of what I'm reading here. Another aspect of this crime, which I've always struggled with, is the fact that we don't actually have anybody who's come forward and said, I saw a man walking along the trail, walking away from the trail, he was covered in blood, or he was soaking wet, etc, etc. Now, I can't really explain that. Now, some people have said, well, he had a shave, or he changed his clothes. Again, not really buying into that particular idea. For me, the idea of shaving yourself, I don't really see anyone thinking that up and actually considering it as a good idea. So why do we have a lack of eyewitnesses who have come forward describing what you would expect to see on, you know, during broad daylight on that trail, someone exiting the crime scene? I mean, 
How could someone commit that crime unless they know that they can get to somewhere safe to clean up, to change their clothes potentially? It does sound a little bit strange, the fact that these girls are found on Ron Logan's property. There's not an eyewitness account of, as I say, someone covered in blood, someone drenched, someone you know with wet trousers or blood all over them. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? It's also mentioned there in that document that they believe that the girls' bodies were moved and staged. And that is as it's written there, moved and staged. Combine that with the text message concerning Ron Logan at around 10pm that night, which they believe was in the vicinity of where the girls were discovered. Does that tie into the potential of the bodies having been moved at some point? I guess for me what counts against that being a possibility is the amount of blood found at the crime scene. The way that the FBI agent speaks in that document tells me that a lot of blood was found at the crime scene. So you can't really suggest that they've been moved elsewhere, then brought back again, and all of a sudden this blood has somehow reappeared. To me, the impression I get is you know, a very sort of gruesome crime scene, and they've been killed where they've been found, if that makes sense. They may have been moved slightly, maybe moved away from the bank edge a little bit, and, and you know, staged or placed into position. But that's certainly the impression that I get when reading that statement there. One final point to make before we close today's video is the usage of the word participated in the killings when referring to the man on the bridge. Now, as I discussed earlier in this video, I'm certainly of the belief there's at least one individual concerned with this case, probably some sort of ring. That's my own, as I say, personal thoughts and feelings on that. But the usage of the word there, participated in the killings, as I say, gives me the impression that they're looking for more than one person. Surely, if they believe it was just the man on the bridge, just one individual concerned in these murders, they'd have used sort of terminology like responsible for the killings. But as I say, the usage of the word there, participated in the killings, tells me personally it's something different. Many thanks for joining me for today's video. Do feel free to leave your own thoughts and theories in the comments section below. I'll be sure to check those out. If you liked the video, please do give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. And I look forward to seeing you all again in the next video. Take care. Cheers.